right, good afternoon. And welcome to this session at the Mid-America Truck Show. This is the FMCSA updates uh, session. I wanna welcome you personally to this session. It's a great turnout. Uh, my name is Tom Keene. I am the Associate Administrator for Research and Registration with FMCSA. And uh, again, I'd like to welcome you to this session. Appreciate your input and your uh, interest in this session. Now, the, the session is titled FMCSA Updates. Uh, we will be focusing today on three specific uh, uh, research studies and or programs that we thought would be of interest to you, uh, beginning with a driver compensation and safety study that we're engaged in, as well as a commercial driver detention time study, and then uh, we will uh, wrap up the session with a discussion or presentation on the drug and alcohol clearinghouse. And I would just personally like to thank you. This is my first opportunity since the pandemic to meet with a professional drivers group of this size. Uh, we all work through the pandemic in our various ways. I would just like to personally thank you for the absolutely critical work that our professional truck drivers uh, conducted during the pandemic uh, and with the supply chain challenges over the the last two years, uh, just absolutely critical to keep this country moving. So I did wanna take this opportunity to thank you personally uh, for the great work that you all have done over the last three years. With that said, uh, let me introduce the presentations. Uh, the, many of you may know the bipartisan infrastructure law was enacted November 15th of 2021. <coughs> And beyond our traditional safety mission and the focus on safety, which is our collective focus, I know, as a group, uh, the, what we call the bill legislation uh, afforded us an opportunity uh, to look into some other areas uh, beyond our core safety mission. Congress, uh, in designing and enacting that authorizing legislation, which is really the blueprint for uh, commercial vehicle safety, actually highway infrastructure, um, all kinds of transportation uh, uh, policy, but specifically to FMCSA, really uh, sets the blueprint for the safety work that will be done over the next uh, five or six years, depending on the length of the legislation itself. Um, but it afforded an opportunity to look at some issues beyond the core safety focus. And that's what this session is about. Um, related to safety, but in terms of the first two presentations, you'll hear looking more at the quality and the challenges and uh, the work that you do as professional drivers and to examine some of the challenges you're facing uh, and um, providing potential recommendations for improvements that can be made. So again, we appreciate you being here. We look forward to taking Q&A, um, depending on how long the presentations are, try to take a question or two after each presentation, and then we'll leave the last part of the session for open Q&A. Uh, depends how long the presentations themselves go. With that said, let me introduce our first speaker. Uh, Nicole Michelle is a program manager in the Office of Research and Registration at FMCSA, uh, one of our top managers in the research office, and she's uh, responsible for managing high visibility research projects aimed at reducing and preventing crashes involving large trucks and buses. Uh, she has a wealth of experience um, with FMCSA, and before that, she has bachelor's degrees uh, in mathematics and master's degrees in statistics and finance. Uh, and with that, I'll introduce Nicole Michelle. Thank you, Tom. So let's hope I can figure out how to work this clicker. Good afternoon, everybody. It's good to see you all here. Um, I echo Tom's sen sentiments that we're excited that um, you are here to listen to our updates and thank you for attending and taking the time to hear from us. Um, I'm clicking next and it's not going. <laughs> 
Um, okay. So the bipartisan infrastructure law, as Tom mentioned, required us to conduct a study on driver compensation. And really what we're looking at here is um, how the various impact various methods of compensation may impact safety and driver retention. What we've heard from Congress is that the rationale for this study is really to look at ways to address potentially um, unsafe working conditions in the industry or um, unfair working um, conditions in the industry. So they required us to uh, conduct this study through the Transportation Research Board, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with them. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time giving you some background on how they conduct their studies because it is a little unique to some of our other studies that we've conducted. So the Transportation Research Board falls under the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, specifically the National Academy of Sciences. And their mission is to be a non-governmental institution that provides independent and objective findings. They focus on unbiased expertise through a scientific process. And I want to point out that their experts serve as volunteers. So they're not financially tied to um, the work that they're doing. The Transportation Research Board themselves, um, they maintain the focus on unbiased and evidence-based research studies. And they do this through a selection of an expert committee who is thoroughly vetted for biases or conflicts of interest. So there, there's an overview. It's very blurry, I apologize. <laughs> There's an overview of their study process here. Um, but we're in that larger chunk that's, it's a green arrow, and it says committee meetings, information gathering, deliberations, and drafting the report. So that's where the study currently is. Um, they're focused on gathering information around the problem and identifying what um, recommendations or findings they might have to put into the report. Specifically, their main activities are to thoroughly investigate a problem, and while investigating this problem, they're conducting deliberations and discussing the problem, and then they'll bring all this information together in a final report where they will produce recommendations and findings. The report itself is subject to a rigorous peer review process, which is one of the areas where they can um, meet that legislative mandate for consultation along with, of course, investigating and collecting data. They're gonna be consulting with various organizations, um, motor carriers, drivers. But in terms of the peer review process, there are no restrictions on who can be a peer reviewer. So um, some, of the, some of the restrictions on who can serve on a committee due to conflicts of interest or biases does not follow through to the peer review process. That's a much more open process. So our role as the sponsoring agency, I thought it was important to clarify that um, while we are the sponsor of the study and we can provide our thoughts and guidance to the committee, we are really not involved in their deliberations or their recommendations or findings. We are kept on the sidelines and that's to really protect the integrity of this study and make sure that FMCSA's own opinions aren't biasing the study. Um, so just a note there, because again, this is a very unique study in how it's conducted through this independent expert committee. So I posted the committee members up here. You can find their full bios on the project website, which I'll be po um, showing next, but you'll see that there's a lot of strong academic background and transportation background on this committee. Um, they've had several committee meetings already, which we'll, go, we'll discuss in a little bit. Um, but it's a strong committee who understands the topic and understands the transportation industry. And we're confident that these, these experts together will be able to produce um, a strong final report for us. So the project website I have up here um, you can go here to monitor any upcoming public meetings. You can register for them. 
Some of them are purely virtual and some of them are virtual and in-person hybrid meetings, but the plan is for all of them to have some sort of virtual component as has become the norm these days. Um, and you can also request any materials from public meetings through this website. So to date, they have had three, meeting, three meetings. Um, the last one occurred just last Friday. The first meeting was very procedural for the committee, um, but the second meeting in January, for those of you who aren't aware, was a large public session where they heard from government, academic, and industry experts. Um, and then the next day, the committee met in closed door sessions to discuss what they heard, what they thought, um, and deliberate their next steps. The meeting last Friday, they heard from women in trucking and American trucking associations, and then had um, deliberations immediately following that that were closed session. So I wanted to spend some time talking about the January 18th meeting, because I think this meeting was really important to laying the groundwork for the committee. Um, we focused, we as FMCSA, focused on working with TRB to make sure that this meeting really set the groundwork for the committee to understand the landscape of the problem. So we focused on making sure that they understood the relevant regulations, the full picture of what compensation is, because it's more than just your pay, and making sure that they understood how things are actually happening in the world today. To that end, the committee heard from government, industry, and academic experts who have been studying this topic for a very long time. Uh, we coordinated very closely with the Department of Labor to make sure that the committee understood what FMCSA regulates and Department of Labor regulates and how our regulations should be understood and interpreted. For example, both of our agencies use the terms on duty, but it means two very different things between your hours of service or um, when it comes to comp compensability from the Department of Labor. We also invited Consumer Finance Protection Bureau to discuss how lease agreements can potentially affect total compensation and how much a driver is really bringing home. We heard from Atri, who confirmed that pay is one of, not necessarily the top, but one of the top priorities for drivers in the surveys that they conduct. Um, Tom Weekly from OIDA gave a really heartfelt speech that I think really brought all of you to the table for this committee, and he discussed the difficulties that you face in working 60 to 70 hour days and not necessarily having a stable or known paycheck at the end of the week. He made a fair point that pay by mile structure causes the drivers to be the ones absorbing the inefficiencies in the processes. Finally, the committee also heard from Steve Vaselli and Michael Belzer, who have been studying this topic for a very long time. They both echoed prior comments and mentioned that they were glad this study was finally being conducted um, by the government. So for the study outcomes, we are coming up on halfway through the project. The study is planned to conclude in July of 2024. Um, there may be extensions if needed, but as of right now, we're anticipating that the final report will be issued in July of 2024. And what we've heard from Congress is that they're really hoping for actionable recommendations before the next authorization bill. So while the committee may recommend additional or further research, what we're really looking at here is are there policy or legislative changes that need to be made throughout the government um, in this area? So that is the hope for the report. And again, with this structure with TRB, you know, FMCSA will be kept. Um, we'll find out when everybody else does what the actual recommendations and findings are. And then I have my contact information. Great, thank you, Nicole. Um, and, and as Nicole said, the TRB committee is independent. It's designed that way. We have input, industry has input, labor groups have input as all part of the 
the open meeting process and presenting to the committee thoughts. And, and as you saw, or if you research the backgrounds of a lot of these committee members, they've done uh, years and years of uh, research in transportation, specifically trucking, many of them. Uh, with that said, we have a couple of minutes. If there's a question or two that anybody wants to ask uh, Nicole about her presentation specifically, I'd welcome that question now. Yes, sir. And uh, before, let me try to get you a mic, um, if possible, just so the rest of the audience can hear you. Thank you, Nicole. Is this on? Yes. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so Clifford Peterson, I write for Overdrive as a blogger, 20-year trucking veteran. I'm also a PhD student uh, doing research in the industry. I'm curious as to why, when I saw the committee members, why you do not have a human factor psychologist or an IO psychologist on there so you can understand the psychological impacts of the compensation. We'll have to figure out how to turn that on and off, sorry. Um, so, you know, with the committee, we were able to make recommendations to the Transportation Research Board, and I, I do believe we asked them to consider human factors um, as one of the specialties that would be important for this. Um, and I do think some of the committee members may have academic backgrounds in human factors. I'd have to go back and look. Uh, but again, we don't have we don't have any say on who actually gets nominated to the committee. And I would just add to that. I'll, I wrote that down. I think it's a good question. We um, we have and we continue to uh, provide suggestions on expert testimony. So um, I'm happy to forward that point through Nicole to the committee uh, uh, chair to say, hey, would you consider uh, having this person uh, present to the committee? So it's a good point. Thank you. Other questions at this point? Sorry, the lights are very bright today, so I can't really see you. Thanks. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone can hear the question. That's why I asked you to use the mic. I, I'm just curious, uh, your committee members, how many of them have driving experience? I do not know the answer to that question. So I do know um, Stephen Burks. Yes, I'm sorry. I get. I get Stephen Burks and Steve Vaselli's name mixed up sometimes. Stephen Burks is the committee member who does have driving experience. Um, I will say, keeping in mind that committee members cannot have any financial interest in the topic makes it difficult to get drivers who are currently um, employed on the committee because Yeah. So Stephen Burks is, um, and again, I I do know that the committee has been in touch with Tom Weekly from OIDA, um, and I know they are interested in when they get to the point of the peer review of the report, you know, reaching out and seeing if they can have if any drivers are interested um, in participating in that process. And I think they're coordinating that through OIDA, is my understanding, um, just to make it easier to have a focal point of contact. Yeah, and I would add, um, you know, they, they, uh, they accept applications from interested individuals and then they do a conflict of interest check. Uh, there were a couple of industry participants that didn't get through the conflict of interest uh, check, but they are searching for other uh, participants to fill those roles uh, and to your point, that includes drivers to retired or otherwise. However, uh, one important aspect of this study is the expert testimony or presentation. So 
as Nicole said, Tom Weekly spoke, uh, and we continue to send them suggestions on individuals or organizational representatives that they may want to have present or interview as part of the meeting process. And I think there's going to be a minimum of six meetings over the two years, uh, so there's ample time for them to accept additional testimony. And I believe the study can be extended six months to the end of uh, calendar year 2024 if they have more research uh, that they want to delve into. With that said, the, the recommendations that come out of TRB, can it be anywhere from you need to do more research, there needs to be additional data and analysis on this. Uh, but beyond that, there could be regulatory recommendations to the federal agencies. And as Nicole pointed out, because this, the direction for this study came from Congress in the bill legislation, the committee can make recommendations back to Congress on legislative changes to improve uh, or facilitate um, improve safety through compensation methods. So with that, let me move on um, to make sure we get all our speakers in. And it's a perfect segue into the next study. This was not directed to the agency, uh, this particular study, through the bill legislation, although there was one reference to detention or retention in the legislation. We were already working on uh, setting up this study uh, to follow on a past study. And I have John Mueller here. John is our uh, chief of the research division in FMCSA. Uh, and this is a focus on measuring the prevalence and severity of detention time imposed upon you, the driver, uh, in many different segments, in many different operational environments. Um, and it's a three-year study. So with that, I will uh, introduce John Mueller. All right, hello everyone. I'm John, as Tom mentioned. I'm uh, gonna talk to you a little bit about this project that we have, the impact of driver detention time on safety and operations. I've organized my thoughts into three main sections. First, a little bit about some of the prior research that's been done in this area. Uh, next, more recently, on a phase one study that uh, FMCSA published in 2014. And then lastly, some details on the, the study that we currently have underway. Um, so the topic of driver detention is not new. It's been looked at over time quite a bit. Uh, three studies I've listed here for your reference. Uh, in 2003, also with the Transportation Research Board, we did a synthesis study. Um, this information is available online and, and readily accessible. We also looked at it as part of the Motor Carrier Efficiency Study in 2009. And then outside of DOT, the General Accountability Office also looked at this. And while uh, these studies assessed self-reported uh, data from drivers and carriers and safety managers as opposed to like an instrumented uh, data collection. Um, but it's clear that uh, generally, not surprisingly, detention time was and continues to be a high priority issue for the industry. Two thirds of all drivers experience some amount of detention time. And then with that come significant cost impacts, lost wages, extended drive times, certainly impacts to hours of service and, and things related to that. Um, some of these studies did identify some causes that looked at potential reasons for it and looked at things like uh, uh, issues with the facility, whether it's staffing or equipment, maybe the number of bays. Uh, there were also uh, looked at things, just complications with scheduling and the logistics of just the industry in general. Um, the one thing to point out too is these studies all use that unofficial definition of detention time of accepting two hours beyond loading and unloading. So just Keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So more recently in 2014, I've included the link here. There's a lot more in this report than what I'm gonna be able to cover today, uh, but there is quite a bit there. And this was again done in 2014. And the objective here was to do the more quantitative data collection to understand you know, where this driver detention time is happening and to what degree. I'd still use the same two hour definition. Um, but largely relied on third-party technology and GPS information to uh, determine what, the, what was happening in terms of detention. Uh, the key findings, some of the key findings here, the 11% of all the stops exceeded that two-hour window by about an hour and a half. Uh, in terms of some of the trends amongst medium-sized carriers, medium-sized carriers had the longest duration as well as the most frequent occurrence of detention. 
time. Um, the truckload, less than truckload comparison. Um, truckload was more frequently de uh, detained, but the durations were similar uh, in length to less than truckload in private. And then lastly, on reefer and dry van, they had just had the longest average duration. So there's a lot in the report, a lot of ways that they looked at what, what was happening. So I just encourage you to get more details there. Um, but like with this study and all of our studies, there are limitations. Um, and we account for those in the report. And a few of them that I just want to point out is that the GPS data that was collected was only from a small number of carriers and was only used to estimate detention time. So it got to be a little tricky to actually figure that part out. Um, there's still confidence in those findings, but just, again, some of the limitations that we want to identify. There were an identified, an unidentified number of carriers that could, or, or of operators that were likely working as contractors for medium and large carriers, which could have been the reason why smaller carriers were underrepresented in the data. Um, the, uh, the GPS data was cross-referenced to driver logs and was only coded for on-duty time which made it a challenge to actually figure out at the facility how much of that was spent waiting versus how much of that was spent loading and unloading. Um, the goal at the beginning was to look at a lot of different vari uh, variables in the industry to just kind of segment out what was happening, but we were only able to identify three or parse the data with three, and that was the carrier operation size, uh, the operation type, and the freight type. It would have been nice, and we tried to get more information on like the driver type, whether it was owner operator or a company driver. Um, it would have been nice to know more about the facility and the location, the size, different aspects that we could look at the variable and understand the variables and understand what was happening. Um, also would have liked to know more about disincentives that may have been in place at the time for detention time. We didn't, didn't know much about that in, in the study. So taking all of that into account, all the past research that's been done, uh, and with this recommendation from the DOT's Office of Inspector General, which was to develop a, a, develop a, collaborate with the industry to develop another study to get actual representative data on the frequency and severity of detention time. And so this study, there's three focus areas. The first one is to actually perform the study, collect the data, put together the plan to really quantify what's happening in terms of that, again, frequency and severity. Uh, next, with the innovation and developments in the technology that exists, is a way to use some of the ITS systems, the intelligence transportation systems, to more accurately measure what's actually happening. And then finally, bringing all that together in a final report to answer the research questions, um, off, off, our, offer our findings in the report, and perhaps uh, put, put out some strategies that could potentially mitigate uh, what's happening in terms of detention. So again, back to the definition, I just want to point out when we started putting this plan together, uh, it became clear if we're really going to do a specific data collection and try to understand what's happening, we needed a better definition uh, to make sure the data that we're gathering, you know, is easy to, to take and get and analyze. So um, thinking about it this way, in terms of the total dwell time, the total time spent at the facility is composed of these three pieces, the loading and the unloading time, the time that cargo is actively being moved or into or out of the vehicle. The other time that's not loading and unloading, but still work-related, paperwork or checking the load or checking the vehicle. And then the leftover piece of that is the detention time. So again, detention time is the difference between the total dwell time at the facility minus that combination of loading and then the active dwell time. And this pie chart here is, is uh, more meant to help kind of explain the definition. It's not intended to represent what might actually be happening uh, right now. So in terms of the research questions, again, uh, the, I, the IG asked us to look at the frequency and severity, and we'll be doing that. Also uh, looking at any fluctuation with the time frame, the time of the day or time of week that, uh, that the deliveries are being uh, made. And then the, on the safety side, the likelihood of crashes that are in, um, involved with detention or impacts to hours of service violations or incidents of fatigue. A lot of these questions, at least those first three, will be using that uh, quantitative data collection to help answer. But another piece of the study is on the qualitative side with interviews and participating carriers that we hope to get more information on the cost they experience with uh, detention time in terms of the productivity issues or supply chain problems. And if they are using mitigation strategies for detention time, what are they and how effective are they? Uh, again, on the last four questions here, on the ITS side, are there innovations in technology uh, that are out there with some of the telematic systems? Uh, are they able to better accurately measure or capture that in some way? 
Uh, we'll look at appointment times. If a vehicle has an appointment time versus one that doesn't, does that offer a difference or an improvement? And again, the definition, is it an issue for the industry? Would there be a benefit to having a more standardized formal definition of detention time? And then more distinct on the facility side, are there differences with port terminals versus other kind of facilities? Just trying to understand where, where those differences happen. So in terms of where we are, uh, the project, as Tom mentioned, we've been working on it for a little bit. It started in July or 2021, the end of 2021 and putting those plans together to kick off the meeting in July of 2022. And since then, we've finished these first four steps, mostly in the planning of the project and the study design and refining it with a peer review group. Uh, and right now, it's in the midst of building this information collection request for submission and approval to the Office of Management and Budget. And that we expect uh, in J January of 2024 and on the limitation slide that I didn't mention, it was only six months. This time we're gonna be looking at 12 months to try to get more uh, time uh, of data and seasonal effects that may occur throughout that year. Um, using the rest of the time there in uh, 2025, the next six or seven months, we'll do the analysis and understand uh, what's happening, prepare the final report and the briefings and the materials, um, and then also uh, make, make a public use data set available for anyone else that may be interested in looking at the data more closely. Um, the goal there is to have everything done by the July 2025 or shortly thereafter. Uh, a little bit more about task six, the data collection. The team is being led by the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute and also includes TVS and Motive and Scopolitis as partners. The goal of this task is to leverage a large number of carriers and vehicles out there that have TVS and Motive and that to more accurately determine those pieces of detention time definition that I described earlier. Um, the data collection plan is still uh, being formalized and again subject to the OMB approval. Um, however, the goal here is to have a final sample of 80 fleets and 2,500 vehicles with a medium fleet size of around four vehicles. So on the qualitative side though, we want to understand through interviews with the carriers what their detention time costs are and what their experiences are either with that, with mitigation strategies they might be using, again, the ITS technologies that are in place and to what benefit they offer, uh, and then again, talk to them about how they define detention time. Lastly, we'll link the federal crash and violation data with telematics, with the telematics and ELD data to allow an analysis of the safety benefits in relationship to DOT reportable crashes or moving violations, inspection data, the things that we get from our motor carrier management information system and our commercial driver's license information system. Uh, task seven is the analysis after the data collection is done. Um, this will be an attempt to answer those research questions to, ex to, to really understand and examine the relationship between detention time and the characteristics, as I mentioned, the carrier size and operation, the facility type and location and size if there are variations in the time of day or the time of year where it's occurring. And then ultimately, fundamentally, is the detention time itself, the frequency, the number of detained stops, and the duration or the severity of those stops. And then utilizing uh, the qualitative carrier interviews, supplementing those findings that we couldn't answer through the data uh, to help understand and report those trends with you know, our plots and charts to understand what's there and what the trends are, what significant um, things that we can see about the data. Lastly is my contact information. Uh, you can reach out to me, ask me questions about this or anything else that we have, uh, that we're working on. Um, I did wanna put a, a short plug in here for an event that we have coming up in April, and that is our analysis research and technology forum. Uh, in that program, you'll hear and get more updates on the product or projects that we have underway uh, in the research division, as well as the analysis division uh, and the technology division. Uh, there's a QR code there. Um, I'm not sure if it'll scan, but you can see me after or send me an email. I make, I'll make sure you get the link to register. It's an online uh, virtual event, um, but we hope to have a, a, some good presentation. So you'll learn a lot more about what we're doing. And it's free, free to register, yeah, free to participate there. So with that, uh, thank you. Thank you, John. And yes, as John noted, that is a, uh, it's an event, four hour. Um, it's really a review of our research uh, portfolio. And um, 
it went off the screen, but hopefully you scan the QR code. Uh, and uh, it's, thank you. And uh, it's, it's just a good opportunity to share with our stakeholders, primary stakeholders like you, uh, what research we're doing into commercial vehicle safety. Uh, I think these are two good examples. It's the reason I put them first of what I personally call win-win opportunities. Uh, and by that, I mean um, opportunities to improve your working conditions, break down barriers, um, improve flow, eliminate market failures, but also good for safety. So I will admit, as both the speakers said in their presentation, uh, presentations, FMCSA's regulatory authority is limited to, uh, in some respects, to solve both of these issues, but it is our hope that uh, conducting the studies uh, and publishing the reports will raise visibility on what I call these micro-market failures, which have uh, permeated, existed for a while, um, and helping you, again, to reduce barriers to doing your job uh, but also improve your personal safety and highway safety overall. So uh, the next presentation uh, is on the drug and alcohol clearinghouse. Uh, Brian Price is our drug and alcohol program manager at FMCSA. Brian also has a wealth of experience, uh, uh, mostly in FMCSA, but also beyond that in industry. Uh, 32 years with FMCSA, many different positions. This is obviously not a research study, it, it is a program, an active program, but something we thought you would be interested in hearing updates on. So with that, uh, I'll bring up Brian. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm gonna hit on four topics here real quick related to the clearinghouse. Uh, touch briefly on the background just to give folks a sense for why the clearinghouse was developed in the first place. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some very recent uh, updates or enhancements we've made to the system as we continuously try to improve what is still just a, a three-year-old system. Uh, then I think what most folks generally find uh, most interesting is some of the statistics that we see terms of the types of violations that are reported to the clearinghouse, that kind of thing. And then finally, I just wanted to give folks an update on a new regulation that's been published, but its implementation is coming down the pike that we call the clearinghouse two rule. So just in terms of background, very quickly, one of the things I traditionally like to try and point out was uh, this, this clearinghouse is something that was widely supported um, uh, industry was actually um, lobbying Congress for a number of years saying, you know, basically, you know, we're spending money on drug and alcohol testing, we're doing the right thing to keep our highways safe, but sometimes we'll test a guy, we'll, you know, he'll test positive on a random, and then a couple of days later, we'll see that same guy driving at our competitor across the street, you know, how is that happening? Why isn't this guy going through the regulatory return to duty process. So there was an understanding that this clearinghouse uh, would help fill that safety gap, so to speak. So after we published the, the, the clearinghouse regulation, uh, our agency set to work on building it. And basically now what the clearinghouse is, we've established this database in Washington where all these different types of drug or alcohol violations are reported linked to a commercial driver's CDL number to our database in Washington, okay? And then from there, um, employers are required to, as part of the pre-employment process, uh, obviously check this clearinghouse to make sure that the driver they're hiring doesn't have one of those positive tests from the past. You know, um, another thing that employers are required to do is at least once a year um, check the clearinghouse on all the drivers in their roster. Now, a question might be, well, you know, what, what kind of drug and alcohol violations go into the clearinghouse? Some of this is fairly obvious, uh, like verified positive drug tests, DOT drug tests. Those get reported to the clearinghouse by medical review officers. Uh, if someone's had um, 
too much Kentucky bourbon, test positive on like a post-accident test or something, BAC over 0.04, that's going to get reported to the clearinghouse. What we call actual knowledge violations, a good example of that that gets reported by employers to the clearinghouse is, for example, if a commercial driver gets cited uh, for DUI roadside in a commercial motor vehicle, those kind get reported up. But this last category I wanted to kind of highlight here, this refusal to test. The reason I wanted to mention this is uh, we're, we're trying to do as much as we can to educate the industry, imploring employers to educate their drivers about what a refusal to test is and what the consequences are. Basically, if a driver has a refusal to test reported to the clearinghouse, it's the exact same consequences as testing positive for methamphetamine and cocaine. Uh, they have to go through the return to duty process. And, and I know from where I sit that, you know, a, a high percentage of these are, the guy gets selected for a random, he knows he's dirty, and he says, well, I'm quitting. You know, that, that's a type of refusal that doesn't bother me. What does bother me, though, is I see too many instances come across my desk from drivers, you know, it's like, hey, dispatcher said when you drop your load, deadhead over here to Quest, you know, you got to do a random drug test. So, fine, the guy drives over, he, he parks a little funny, you know, he has trouble parking, and he goes in, it's taken too long, and then he's like, oh man, I'm parked, I don't want to get a parking ticket, I'm parked funny out there. Well, you know, I'll just leave and tell the dispatcher I can do it tomorrow and those get reported as a refusal. So again, we're trying to do everything we can to implore carriers to educate their drivers on, on those consequences, because we hate to see guys get stuck with those kinds of violations in those instances. Okay, some quick program updates and system enhancements. Uh, just a few weeks ago in March, one of the things we added was um, if an employer you know, hires driver Brian Price, say January 1st, um, and does a query, I look good. Uh, if anything is reported to my record over the next 12 months, then that employer that hired me is gonna get an email notification that there's new information. You might ask, well, why is that important? You know, that would come up on the annual check. Well, what we heard from industry was they were seeing instances the clearinghouse used to only provide that update if something new came in within 30 days. But companies were coming to us and saying, hey, you know, I hired driver Brian Price. He looked good. He passed his pre-employment test. Hired him in January. I did the annual query in December and found out he had a positive test back in June. I knew nothing about because, you know, he saw that XYZ trucking was paying a little better, had more home time. He snuck over there and uh, did a pre-employment test, tested positive, and you know, obviously he kept his mouth shut about it, but we had him on the road and had complied with the regulations and did everything we were supposed to do, but knew nothing about it. Well, this new email, email notification kind of plugs that gap, so to speak. Again, if a company queries a driver, anything new is reported to their record over the next 12 months, the company is going to get an email notification. Another quick enhancement, um, this one's maybe minor by comparison, but one of the things we were seeing from a compliance standpoint, uh, you know, sometimes drivers would get a positive test, they'd go through the return to duty process, um, you know, see a substance abuse professional, have that clean return to duty test, get put back on the road, but then we were seeing a lot of employers weren't necessarily uh, conducting the, the additional follow-up tests. <clears throat> so we just put this little alert symbol on the clearinghouse to try and better highlight that even after that clean return to duty test, there still are additional follow-up tests required. I'm gonna grab some water here real quick, sorry. <coughs> Okay, so let's jump quickly then into what we're seeing in terms of stats. I apologize, I know these numbers are probably um, 
probably can't make them out from beyond the front row. Um, but all this information is publicly available on our Clearinghouse website. Uh, right now, just in terms of number of users, we've got over right at 3.7 million drivers registered in the Clearinghouse, over 400,000 employers, um, 16,000 third-party administrators, <coughs> then I could go on over 2,000 MROs. But what most people are interested in, understandably, is what kind of violations are we seeing? Um, after three years and change, <coughs> we're looking at nearly 200,000 violations have been reported to the clearinghouse. Um, you can see here the calendar year numbers, and I don't know if this is going to, yeah. See here the calendar year numbers for the first year of the Clearinghouse 2020, 2021, 2022. The numbers are going up. Uh, let's just look at 2022 calendar, for example, out of this bar, out of the, you know, 60 some odd thousand violations, over 57,000 of those are positive tests. You might ask, well, what else is there besides the positive tests on drugs? Well, I remember I was talking about those refusals. We had nearly 10,000 refusals reported to the clearinghouse in 2022. Again, just an example to show you the, the volume of violations that were getting reported into the clearinghouse. Again, nearly 200,000 in just a little over three years. <coughs> what are folks testing positive for? Anybody surprised by these numbers? By and large, marijuana is by far uh, the most common drug identified in our positive drug tests. One of the things I always point out, though, well, two things, actually. Let's back up with marijuana in general. Real common question is, what if it's legal in my state? Uh, what about medicinal marijuana? If you want to be a commercial driver, still a, still a no-go. You can't, um, having a medical marijuana card or... Uh, being le recreational legal in your state doesn't allow you to uh, a, j a get out of jail free card, so to speak, from marijuana and DOT drug testing. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Another thing I point out, though, with these numbers is that clearly you can see here it is a lot more than just marijuana. In fact, um, the other point I always make with this data is if you look closely at the numbers and you add up the cocaine, meth, and amphetamine, when you add those together, those three drugs uh, show up in about three out of ten, or one in, one in three, rather, of uh, DOT drug tests. So it's not an insignificant number. <clears throat> okay, what, what have been the impacts overall uh, of this drug and alcohol clearinghouse? Well, as of March, the most current data we have uh, right now, there, there have been over 175,000 drivers have a violation reported. Remember I mentioned we had seen though like 200,000 violations. If you do the math, that, that means what you might expect. There are a fair number of drivers that get multiple violations reported to the clearinghouse. Um, as of today, there are 100, almost 126,000 drivers in prohibited status, meaning basically if an employer does a query on them or a roadside uh, truck inspector stops them, they're prohibited from operating. They're not supposed to be on the road. Um, you can see here that nearly 50,000 drivers have gone through the return to duty process, uh, are green lighted, so to speak. They're no longer prohibited of that 175,000 that have had a violation reported. Now, one of the things we're continuing to monitor closely and try to keep an eye on is this number right here. You know, out of this 126,000 roughly drivers that are currently prohibited, three out of four of them haven't started that return to duty process. So the question for us as safety regulators is, well, where are they going? So 
unfortunately, we know some of them go to work for companies that aren't checking the clearinghouse, that know nothing about the clearinghouse. That's an issue. Um, but I think sometimes, too, it's maybe just a, a lack of understanding about the return to duty process itself. So we're trying to do more to educate everyone, including the industry, on the fact that there is a return to duty process. Um, and it, I, I'm not gonna say it doesn't take work, because it does, um, but we're a country of second chances and sometimes, obviously, mistakes are made like these uh, refusal scenarios I, I, I mentioned or, or even a positive test, but the way the process works, the driver has to go to a substance abuse professional, get evaluated, be prescribed some form of treatment, and then the substance abuse professional declares them uh, eligible for a return to duty test in the clearinghouse. The substance abuse professional actually puts that in. This guy's ready for a return to duty test. Now that doesn't remove the red light from the driver. He's still prohibited. But then the employer um, will, will direct the driver for a return to duty test. Assuming that comes up clean, the, the red light's removed, the driver's ready to go back to work, and then the employer has just to take over those additional follow-up tests uh, by regulation, a minimum of which is at least six observed tests over the next 12 months. So the last thing I'm going to hit on, are we okay on time? Okay. Okay, the last thing I'm going to hit on is the Clearinghouse 2 rule. Now you, now you might be sitting there thinking, well, you got your Clearinghouse rule, what, why do you need another one? What's Clearinghouse 2? Okay. So what this is, Simplest way I can put it, this is a, a regulation that's going into effect in November of 2024 that's basically going to establish connections between our clearinghouse database in Washington that I mentioned and all the state DMVs out there, all the commercial driver's license issuing agencies across the country. And basically through this connection, when a violation is reported to the clearinghouse, <clears throat> we're gonna send that information down to the state DMVs, and then by, by regulation, the state DMVs are gonna um, be required to start a suspension process on the driver's CDL privileges. So you might ask, okay, well, so it sounds like feds and states are kind of teaming up here to create more consequences for the positive tests makes sense, but don't you already have the red light in the clearinghouse? Like, how does it really help to bring the state DMVs in? Well, you remember I said some of these drivers may be going to work for companies that aren't checking the clearinghouse? Well, by bringing the state DMVs into the safety equation here and then actually suspending the driver's CDL at the state level, even if a company isn't checking the clearinghouse like they're supposed to, Almost everybody has insurance. Insurance company is gonna run an MVR <coughs> and see that that license is suspended uh, at the state level. By the same token, <coughs> excuse me. By the same token, a roadside officer in rural Oklahoma that may have never heard of the clearinghouse or FMCSA if he runs that license in his, <coughs> his inlet unit, you'll see that the license is suspended <coughs> for a drug and alcohol violation. <coughs> uh, so lastly, <coughs> just to wrap up, <coughs> as my voice is winding down, um, apologies for the voice. I had to cut a cold for the first time in forever. Um, We've got a tremendous number of resources on our Clearinghouse website, um, including job aids, depending on what your function is. For most drivers, it's just registering in the Clearinghouse <coughs> and providing consent to queries. Uh, but if you're a, uh, an employer, and you wanna know how to, how to conduct queries, how to, 
how to purchase query plans. We've got job aids for everything. If, there, if you're a substance abuse professional that wants to know how you register in the clearinghouse, enter information, all kinds of uh, available resources there. So again, apologies for the, the voice kicking out there, but uh, happy to take any questions this time. Great, thank you, Brian. And we have about three minutes for questions. Happy to take as many as we can in that time frame. But please know, this entire team is here throughout today and some into tomorrow. And if you think of a question after this, you can always go to the FMCSA booth. We have a team there. Uh, pose your question to them. It'll get back to these individuals or myself uh, through that grapevine. So any questions from the audience? And it's a little hard to see. I see one in the back, and I see two over here. I got okay, right here. Right here. Me? All right. When I give my consent for an employer to run my background, I'm not opposed to any of this, just to set the preface. Yeah. You are going to give information to companies all year long on the query. You said anything that pops up after the year. That, I didn't that's, sign consent oh. away for a year. I signed consent for them to do the query one time. Is there somewhere on there we're going to sign away for the next year that they can just, you guys can just put any information up there? Yeah, don't you, take that wrong. I'm not opposed to it, but you don't have my consent to do that. Right. No, you, you raise a very good point. And in fact, we've, before we implemented the, this new, we call it the 12 month look back feature. We actually changed the, the notifications that go to drivers to, to make it clear that when you do provide consent, that it is for anything over the next 12 months. <coughs> yes, sir. Okay, another question. Again, what protects the drivers from abuse of this system by a vengeful employer, let's say? Okay, that's another good question. And when you say abuse of the system, <clears throat> like I'm guessing an example of that is, okay, driver price, I want you to take this load um, from Los Angeles to New York, and, and the driver says, well, I'm out of hours to do that. And he says, no, you got to take it. And the driver says, well, I don't want to be unsafe, so I'm quitting. And the dispatcher gets mad and says, oh, all right, I'll show you. I'll just report a refusal to test to yeah, the clearinghouse. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I don't know how prevalent that is. Um, we, we hear it enough to know it probably does happen. And the only thing we can do in those instances, and we have done this, uh, uh, is like reach out to the company to ask for evidence of the actual random selection, you know, like, hey, we need to see uh, that this driver was actually selected randomly from your drug and alcohol testing pool. Um, so uh, the only thing I can say is that in those kind of instances, uh, you can report them to us through our National Consumer Complaint Database, and as resources allow, we can look into those kinds of situations, because you know, those are the kind of things, kind of like these refusals that aren't really refusals that bother us when, when safe drivers suffer consequences that they shouldn't necessarily have to uh, suffer through. All right, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. It's 101, so um, the team will stay up here. If you have questions, come on up to the front but I want to make sure everybody can get to the next session if they need to. Thanks very much for attending and your attention and your questions.